If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 19, verse 5, I'll be reading out the New King James Version. John chapter 19, verse 5. John 19, 5. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. May the Lord place a blessing upon the reading of his word today. Behold the man. The title of the sermon today is Behold. The beginning of the Bible we find in Genesis chapter 22, 7 and 8. The word Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide him a lamb for a burnt offering. One of the most prophetic verses in the Bible. Abraham tells his son that God will provide himself a lamb even though he knows that his son should be the lamb that day. But his son says, I see the fire in the wood. But through this sermon, I hope you get a vision of Jesus, like a sacrifice. But the fact that Jesus is who he says he is, and that you have your eyes turned towards him. In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Isaac is beholding the fire and the wood, wonders where the lamb is. But when the time comes right for the prophecy to be fulfilled, of which Abraham tells him God will provide himself a lamb, John comes up this on the scene and says, Behold the lamb. In the writings of Ellen White, she says, By beholding, we become changed. And I hope you know that verse. What you look at, what you take part in, the music you listen to, all things will change you. And if you're totally surrendered to Jesus, you will begin to have that resemblance. In John chapter 1, verse 35 and 36, only a couple of verses later, John again repeats himself. Again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith again, Behold the Lamb of God. You and I need to be looking for Jesus. We need to be beholding the Lamb of God. Zechariah 6.12 says, and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, the branch. He's talking about Jesus and what he's going to do when he comes to this earth. Back to the book of John, chapter 19, verse 5, it says, Then came Jesus forth wearing a crown of thorns, we just read it, and the purple robe, and Pilate said unto them, Behold what? The man. Pilate had no idea what to do with Jesus. What did Pilate want to do with Jesus? He wanted to let him go. So he has him beaten. And he comes out with a crown of thorns and the robe on him, hoping that these people would take pity on him. Next to him, he's got a, a murderer, Barabbas. He wants him to go to the cross that was prepared for him. 
But Jesus takes the place of a murderer. Do you know who that murderer was? You and I. It was your sins that hung Jesus on that cross. You murdered Jesus. He took your place on that cross because sin killed him. And all of us have sinned and come up short of the glory of God. And whether it's beholding the man or beholding the lamb, you and I need to get a firm visual contact with Jesus. We sing the little song, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And what will disappear? The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You and I need to have our mindset focused on Christ today. There's going to be a lot of distractions in the church as well as outside. You and I need to have a relationship, brothers and sisters. In the book Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White says, To the repentant sinner hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the Holy Spirit reveals the Lamb, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And Christ said, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. What does Jesus want you to think about in these last days? He wants you to think about what He has said. And where do you find that? In the Bible. In the New or Old Testament? Both. That's right. You and I should be studiers of the Word. Praying. Studying. Finding Christ like we've never found Him before. Paul showed how closely God had linked the sacrificial service with the prophetic uh, relating of the one who was to be brought. He calls him a lamb for the slaughter. The Messiah was to give his life as an offering for sin. Looking down through the centuries to the, to the scenes of the Savior's atonement, the prophet Isaiah had said, he testified that the Lamb of God poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sins of what? Many. Jesus died for the sins of the world. And it says he made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 7, 10, and 12. Back to the book of Acts of the Apostles, page 229. Quoting Revelation 13, 8, she says, For three successive Sabbaths, Paul preached to the Thessalonians, reasoning with them from the Scriptures regarding the life, death, and resurrection, the office work, and the future glory of Christ. Called him the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Paul reasoned with them for three Sabbaths about what? Who Jesus was. Do you know who Jesus is? It's one thing to say you have a relationship with Christ. It's another to prove it. And someday you and I be, may be asked to prove our relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you be filled with the Spirit to be able to talk about God? Continuing on page 334, she says, In every true disciple this love, like sacred fire, burns on the altar of the heart. It was on the earth that the love of God was revealed through Christ. It is on the earth that His children are to reflect this love through blameless lives. Thus sinners will be led to the cross to behold the Lamb of God. Of God. In every true disciple, when I read things like that, you know who I think of? Me. I hope when you read, and I hope you're reading, I used to tell people if you want to stay in the church, read. Read. Read about Jesus. 
in every true disciple, this love, like sacred fire, burns on the altar of the heart. And who do I think of when I think of a burning heart? I think of those two walking on the road to Emmaus. They went from being depressed and discouraged that they thought Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus talks with them out of nothing but the Scriptures. Starting from Genesis all the way to Malachi, He tells them the Scriptures concerning Himself. And it says when they ran back to tell the others, their hearts burned within them. Do your hearts burn to tell somebody about Jesus? I hope today I didn't ruin the Sabbath school lesson because I never got into Jeremiah. But I've got heartburn. Things are happening today, brothers and sisters, that I hope you're aware of. In page 591 of Acts of the Apostles, she says this, But all who follow the Lamb in heaven must first have followed Him on the earth. Brothers and sisters, if you don't want to spend time with Jesus here, why would He take you to heaven? Heaven is all about Jesus. If you can't spend time in the Word to know who He is, Paul reasoned three Sabbaths with these folks, trying to share with them, convince them that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, the Messiah. Did they believe him? Many did not. But all who follow the Lamb in heaven must first have followed him on earth, not fretfully, not capriciously, but in trustful loving, willing obedience as the flock follows the shepherd. You and I have got to have a relationship. This plaque that Roger just gave out. These kids did a, a commitment. One and two and three. And I hope as you were listening, you could ask yourself, as I did sitting back here, he said, here's number one. And I asked myself, am I committed to do that. Number two, am I committed to do that? I pray for our youth. They have many, many things that I didn't have to distract them from Jesus. If you don't believe me, just drive down the road and watch what the youth have in their hand. Watch what the adults have in their hand. I just love people. They says, Pastor, I know you think that I'm just doing stuff. But I have all of Ellen White's writings on here. Oh, do you read them? And, they, they're not going to answer that, and I have three different versions of the Bible on here. Oh, do you read them? So I just want you to know, if you see me doodling, I have all that on my phone. What good is that? I've got, I've got six of these at home. What good are they? Where do they need to be? in my head and if you've got all that on your phone delete all the other stuff brothers and sisters we don't have time you believe we got time Revelation 5 starting at verse 8 all the way to Revelation 6 2 I want to read this to you it isn't that long Revelation 5 starting with verse 8 and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And the beast and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand. And thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb 
that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which was in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as were in the seas and all that are in them. Heard I saying, Blessing, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were a noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. We had our meetings not that long ago, and we went through the four horsemen, and maybe you were there and maybe you weren't at the meetings. But do you know and understand the four horsemen? If you don't, you should have been at the meetings. But if you couldn't come to the meetings and you don't know who they are, you need to get out lessons. You need to do something to know what this prophecy is talking about. It's the seven seals of the last days. It's talking about church history and where we are today. What seal are we in today, brothers and sisters? Has to be the, the seventh the sixth seal leads into the seventh. The sixth is the coming of Jesus. When are we going to learn about the seventh? It'll be too late, brothers and sisters. When Jesus comes, before Jesus comes, when the time of trouble comes, there's going to be a sealing. And you and I need to be ready when? Now, today. Today. But are you beholding the Lamb? Are you looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith? Revelation 6, 16 and 17. And he said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? One of the disciples asked that. Who in these last days are going to be able to stand? Revelation 7, 9 through 17. It's a long reading, but we're going to read it. Revelation 7, 9 through 17. And this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And I cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around, around about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, no matter what reason you want to go to heaven, there's only one reason to go to heaven, and that's to see Jesus. And the only reason you would want to go to see Jesus is because you have a relationship with Jesus now. Continues and says, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in the temple. And He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell with them, among them. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. What do you live for today? Every time I preach, I have songs, hymns going through my head. Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus. 
Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of what? Their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Brothers and sisters, no matter where you read in the Bible, it comes back to your relationship with God. Revelation 13, 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. We said at our meetings, there's coming a time where everyone who has ever lived on this earth will be on this earth. The righteous are going to come down with that city. And the wicked are going to be raised. Everyone who has ever lived on this earth will be on this earth at one time. And those that love God will worship Him, and those that did not love Him will worship Him. And they will admit that they were wrong, and He was right. And then they'll be destroyed. What's it going to take to be among those that worship the Lamb? And the answer is to find Him here. That you and I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Revelation 15, 2 and 3 says, And I saw, as it were, the sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God, and they shall sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. These people have gotten the victory over the beast and over his mark. Not long ago I had an Adventist tell me the worst thing with what's happening with the one project and and all the other things coming into our church is they're hearing members of our church say, why aren't we joining, joining the unity of churches? There's a danger, brothers and sisters, if you and I do not know what we believe. Are we condemning another church? No, we are not. We're following Bible prophecy. We're following Bible prophecy. Did God give it to us to follow? He did. And if you don't understand how important it is to take a stand, you won't take a stand. Revelation 17, 13, and 14 says, These have one mind. What do you think that mind is? Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. It says, These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. There's another group that have one mind. You and I need to have the mind of Christ. How will we get that? By spending time with Him. They will have one mind and they'll give all their strength unto the beast and these shall make war with the Lamb and the Lamb shall overcome them for He is Lord of lords and King of kings and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Brothers and sisters, it isn't going to be all about you. It's going to be all about Jesus. Which side are you on? Are you taking time to be on Jesus' side. Because if you're not taking time to be with Jesus, how could you ever be on His side? Revelation 19, 7 through 9 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why did Jesus take the name Lamb? Why did he devise having lamb sacrifices? If you go through prophecy... 
as I have, and you read books, suddenly you realize, and I had to realize it reading it from somebody else. He said, all these nations that are portrayed in the Bible are all wild animals. The bear and the lion, the leopard, they're all wild animals. And Jesus took an animal as his representation, a lamb. A simple lamb led to the slaughter. How's your relationship with this lamb? All the animals would like to force their way into your life. That's the type of animals they are, but not a lamb. A lamb will walk away. That's why Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. It's up to you to open the door. The other animals will kick your door down. They want you. Jesus wants you, but He wants you by you wanting Him. Another thing called Adventist Home. A book written by Ellen White on page 518. And she says this, and I thought it was important to read it to you. The fear of being singular. Professed Christians who are superficial in character and religious experience are used by the tempter as decoys. You understand that? Christians who aren't Christians. What's a Christian? A follower of Christ. You've taken the name of Christ. Who should you act like? Christ. But there's Christians out there that aren't following Christ. Professed Christians who are superficial in character and religious experience are used by the tempter as his decoys. This class are always ready for the gatherings for pleasure of sports and their influence attracts others. Now these are Christians who think sports are the main thing of life. Young men and women who have tried to be Bible Christians are persuaded to join the party and they are drawn into the ring. They do not prayerfully consult the divine standard to learn what Christ has said in regard to the fruit to be born on the Christian tree. I underline this. They do not discern that these entertainments are really Satan's banquet prepared to keep souls from accepting the call to the marriage supper of the Lamb and preventing them from receiving the white robe of character, which is the righteousness of Christ. Christians leading Christians astray. Christians taking Christians where they don't belong. Doesn't that sound terrible? Not non-Christians leading Christians, but Christians leading Christians. Christians who think they're Christians. How many of you have the adult Sabbath school lesson? How many of you read the mission story before the lesson? If you read the last two, it was part one and part two. How many read it? It was about a young man who wasn't a Christian, who wanted to date a girl, and in part two, it never mentions her again. Anybody notice that? He wanted to date this girl, and unbeknownst to him, some kids came up and approached him to go to church. Well, he didn't know what to do with the girl because she was a Christian, and he wasn't going to go to church with her. But someone else invited him to church, and when he got to church, he found out it was her church. And it was a Seventh-day Adventist church. And this young man ends up converted. And he goes out co-portering. I'm just repeating the story for those of you that have read it. And while he's out co-portering, he did it for three years. It must have been near the end of the third year. He goes to the hospital and he visits someone and he thinks he recognizes him and it's one of his drinking buddies. And he says he's unrecognizable. In three years, he's dying. He has a drinking problem and he has AIDS, I believe it said. And he dies. 
And he's in a coma, so he couldn't really witness to him. Maybe he could have, because Marianne tells me that even in a coma you can hear. But he said he could not help, but when he got out of that hospital, thank God that someone took him to a church he didn't want to go to, preach a message he didn't want to hear, only to give his heart. And he said, if I would not have received the call, I could be like him. And then he says in that article, which I, don't, I just have it in my mind, every call God gives me, I must follow. Do you know what that's called, brothers and sisters? That's called Christian growth. You haven't got there yet. Every time God offers you a new thing to learn or a new place to go, you should go if it's a call of God. You're not safe not following God. Continuing in this, she says, they become confused as to what is right for them as Christians to do. There's Christian music out there, brothers and sisters, and youth that isn't Christian. It's called Christian. But remember, Christians are going to lead Christians where Christians don't belong. You've got to decide what a Christian is. They do not want to be thought of singular and naturally inclined to follow the example of others. Thus, they, be, they come under the influence of those who have never had a divine touch on their heart or mind and yet still call themselves Christian. When I was in the gas department, we had summer help come. And bless their hearts, the company that I worked for would offer summer help to the employees' kids. And I had a young man come. He was Lutheran. And I worked for his dad. And he ended up on my crew. And one day he said something about religion. And I asked him what a Lutheran was. And he said, a New Testament Christian. Because I had said something about the Old Testament and he said, we don't need that book anymore. And I can't help because of study and prayer to think about what changed those two men or those two people on the road to Emmaus. Christ told them scripture, didn't he? From what? The Old or New Testament? There was no new. And their hearts burned within them because they knew Jesus. We don't have half-hearted Christians today. We have half-book Christians today. Christians that only want the New Testament. But I don't give up. So what did I ask him? You know what book's in the New Testament? What do you know about the book of Revelation? Well, to make a long story short, short I got called into the office because he went home and told Dad. And in this nice conversation, which I didn't raise my voice or anything, he was abused. I didn't lose my job or anything, but I knew who I wasn't going to talk to anymore. Close mind, brothers and sisters. Thinking he's a Christian has no idea what it means to be a Christian. You think he read the book of Revelation? You and I want to be among those that are saved. What's it going to take to be among those that are saved? Revelation 21, 22 through Revelation 22, 4. It says, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. For there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall be no wise, wise enter into it. Anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, 
but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure water of, of, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Brothers and sisters, all through this book of Revelation, it says nothing except the fact that you need to be a follower of the Lamb of God. So an appeal is made. Adventist Home, page 550. An appeal for personal preparation. I could say these are my words, but they're hers. I urge you to prepare. I urge you to prepare for the coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. Day by day, cast the love of the world out of your hearts. Understand by experience what it means to have fellowship with Christ. Prepare for the judgment that when Christ shall come to be ad admired in all them that do believe, you may be among those who will meet him in peace. In that day the redeemed will shine forth in the glory of the Father and the Son. The angels, touching their golden harps, will welcome the King and his trophies of victory. Those who have been washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb a song of triumph shall peal forth, filling all of heaven. Christ has conquered. He enters the heavenly courts, accompanied by his redeemed ones, the witnesses that his mission of suffering and sacrifice has not been in vain. Brothers and sisters, you and I want to be in heaven if for no other reason to show that Jesus didn't die for nothing. If one person out of all the earth made heaven, would it be worth it? But you want to be there. And so I make that appeal. I urge you, prepare. Prepare. Was France prepared? Did they think they were? Brothers and sisters, we don't know who the enemy is today. Oh, we can talk about the papacy and everything else, but we have no idea who our enemy is. Because in the last days, if you read your Bible, it says father will turn against son and mother will turn against daughter and in-laws will turn against in-laws. You have no idea who your enemy is today. But I hope you know who your best friend is. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grace, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's sing our closing song number 245. rise.
First time it's mentioned in the Bible, <clears throat> the word Christian, it says, and they called them Christians, because all they wanted to talk about was Christ. What do you want to talk about today? More about Jesus. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we can take the name Christian. Help us to not take the Lord's name in vain. If we're going to take the name of Christ, help us to act like Christ. Bless us today as I sing this song over and over again. It's telling us we need more, more of Jesus. May we get more, more of Jesus. Help us to fall in love with our Bibles and want to spend more time with them than we ever have before. The days are closing. We have to have the relationship with the Lamb today if we're going to go to heaven. Bless us as only you can. Dismiss us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.